four. Going up there, sir. I like uh, as a new tradition right before we go live, uh, Logan should always say hitting the button. What's it feel like to hit the button, Logan? <laughs> feel the recoil on my finger. It's mouse kicks. recoil of the recoil of hardcore information getting out to the world. Uh, I'm not going to lie, Freaks. I'm tired. Had a big day in New York yesterday. Shout out to the team at PubKey. Bitcoin third place is really strong in this in this bear market. Great day. Great mining event last night. Shout out to Sim from the Galaxy Digital team and the others that put together their mining report, which we went over. We don't have that in the show notes, but we should pull that up. There's some interesting data in there. Um, but yeah, really good things happening in New York. They're... A bit angry at us that we fled the city, Matt. Bag holder cope. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll love to pub. Uh, it's it's beautiful watching all these um, Bitcoin physical spaces blossom. It really is. But uh, no no regrets personally leaving New York. Moved to Nashville. Yeah, it's it's uh. It was a beautiful day in the city yesterday. I have to admit, I was hopping around. I was in the West Village. I went uptown for a meeting. Back to the West Village. It was like 75 and sunny. Relatively low. Summer day. Not a lot of traffic. Not a lot of foot traffic. It was pleasant. Gotta love a beautiful New York summer day. Yeah. There's a lot going on in the world right now, dude. I had a lot of time to think. I had five hours in the car yesterday. And uh, I think we're going to get a soft landing. Yeah. I think that narrative is getting, I think that narrative is getting kicked out the door this week. No more soft landing. It's never going to fucking no happen. Soft. Anyone with a fucking half a brain knew it wasn't going to happen. But it's the contrarian take on wall street right now fucking ridiculous i know let's get in the clark's dashboard then we'll start with macro talk because i do think it's important um, like people inherently have a bullish bias on everything right yeah but like like humans want to be optimistic and they want to be but We'll, we'll get into it. There's not a lot of reasons to be optimistic after this week in terms of <laughs> the incumbent financial system, banking system, and markets. Very optimistic on the Bitcoin side of things, especially after spending the day in New York yesterday with a bunch of coiners. There's a lot going on, but going to Clark's dashboard, the price of Bitcoin right now is 29,160 cuck bucks. One cuck bucks is going to get you 3,429 sats. Market cap is currently 567.1 billion cuck bucks. We are at block height 801,546. We are between difficulty adjustments. The next one is estimated to be in, it's not estimated to be, the next one is in 822 blocks, estimated to be an upwards 1% difficulty adjustment. So that's changed since last week. There are currently 113,099 transactions in Clark's mempool. We'll go over to mempool.space and see what we're seeing there. A transaction yesterday got it got it confirmed in one block with an eight sat per byte uh, fee. And I must note. Uh, this episode was brought to you by my cousin Courtney, who let me borrow her laptop because mine is currently broken. Shout out to Courtney. This week's well, show would not be possible without best, her. So best sponsor to date. Uh, you <laughs> go to rhr.tv slash Courtney for ten dollars off uh, whatever she's selling. <laughs> she's selling her wares. According to Mempool dot space, there's two hundred and sixty five thousand seven hundred seventy one transactions in Wiz's Mempool. Somebody, of course, just started to mow their lawn behind me. I think we've we scheduled RHR. Okay, good. Good. Um, Remember when you mowed your neighbor's lawn so they'd stop mowing? Good times. Yeah, I had to do. 
I had to do that this summer too. Um, God damn it. Um, so yeah, mempools still more than a hundred blocks of mempool.space to clear. Currently got 8,478.44 Bitcoin and unspent capacity on Samurai's Whirlpool. That's 247.3 million cuck bucks in unspent value. Damn. That is the state of the network. Hash rates ripping. According to mempool.space, current hash rate is 412 exahash. It was 395 yesterday when I checked. So people are plugging in. That's the world. Mining's ripping. Blocks are being produced. And yeah, the incumbent financial system seems to be on dire straits. So I think we'll look back on this last week, particularly as a pretty massive week in a macroeconomic perspective. I think that'll be made clear next year. But it started last Friday when the Bank of Japan made a surprise policy decision and they decided to change course on their yield curve control and sort of expand the range with which they would allow their 10-year Japanese government bond to to move within. And markets have essentially determined that that move wasn't confident enough. They, they moved the end from like a hard 50-bip uh, line to between 50 bips and 100 bips. Uh, and that set the Japanese uh, 10-year government bond uh, yield skyrocketing. They stepped in again yesterday or earlier today, I believe, to fix that. But it doesn't seem like markets are really confident that the Bank of Japan has the ability to control their monetary system right now and their bond markets, which they've been historically the largest buyer of for for many years now. Uh, well, the yen has, yeah, the yen has been um, debasing pretty rapidly against the dollar last i checked was like 142.5 per us dollar and it was at like 139 uh right before that policy decision um and many believe that japan is the canary in the coal mine they were the first country to embark on quantitative easing and monetizing their debt many years ago um and essentially every central bank and government is sort of following the japan model since 2008 and so if japan sort of fumbles the ball here that'll be a signal that every other central bank and government employing that strategy is probably gonna end up with the same fate and then we pan over to the u.s this week um last week jerome powell obviously raised rates 25 bips i don't think we talked about it last week but there was a rate hike and then this week pretty big headlines uh fitch came out and downgraded the U.S. credit score to double A plus from triple A. And so they officially joined S&P at, at labeling the U.S.'s credit worthiness at double A plus. Uh, S&P made that move in 2011. So they've had it there for a while. But considering how much uh, debt we have here, again, we discussed it last week that the Treasury wants to print at least one point eight five trillion dollars worth of treasuries between now and the end of the year, which would expand the debt uh, beyond $34 trillion. So I think what we'd have well over 10% growth on the national debt this year alone. At the same time, the interest expense on the debt uh, is approaching a trillion dollars. Uh, as of Q2, it was at $969 billion dollars that we're paying on the debt. And as the Fed raises interest rates, it's naturally gonna push that higher. So I expect when Q3 numbers come in uh, in October, that the expense on the interest will be well above a trillion dollars. Uh, and then the real big under appreciated stat of the week, I think is WTI crude going above $80. There were big inventory draw that was larger than expected. The SPR is at historical lows since since that started the strategic and reserve. yeah our salt caverns so, oil yeah not they're not filled with it anymore so we have a yeah. combination of things and that, that's matt and i were discussing it before we hit record but that's been the big narrative the mainstream is that uh we're gonna have this soft landing the fed is actually doing really well if you look at the job numbers the cpi it seems like they're 
really being effective with their interest rate hike policy. However, I think it's becoming abundantly clear that uh, the soft landing is not going to materialize because of the Bank of Japan uh, gets into a big problem. The Fed's likely going to have to step in because they're holding the Japanese government's holding the largest amount of U.S. treasuries. And so the U.S. government doesn't want them to sell those. So they're going to have to step in and add some buying pressure there uh, with the downgrade. That certainly hurts her debt situation as well and probably increases the rates that uh, that the government has when they take out debt moving forward. Obviously, the interest expense has gotten out of hand. And then I think really the sneaky thing is the oil markets, where if we scream towards $100, the inflation, as measured by CPI, is to be rising while the Fed has rates at um, the highest rates they've had them in in quite some time. And that creates a very precarious situation where the Fed had this narrative just a month ago and CPI was at 3.3%. Jobs numbers were looking good. They seemed to be on the way towards 2%. But with all the situations unfolding in sovereign debt markets, coupled with increasing oil prices like that is going to be a terrible situation for the Fed where if inflation's rising and the sovereign debt situation's gotten to such a point where the Fed is forced to step in and begin buying treasuries and other um, government bonds, uh, maybe from Japan, uh, that they're going to have reverse course on their interest rate policy, cut rates at a time when inflation has not been solved. And I mean, I think I certainly would argue, I won't speak for you, Matt, but I don't think inflation solves to begin with. I think obviously CPI has gone significantly lower, but as we all know, CPI is incredibly manipulated and uh, real inflation is much higher than the 3.3% that's that was being reported last month. And so, yeah, I do think um, everybody that's cheerily, the soft landing is going to have egg on their face by the end of this year. It's really a pretty big shit show and all the while the mainstream media once you focused on aliens superconductors trump indictments and the hunter biden scandal and it seems like everything going on in these financial markets is sort of being swept under under the rug in the mainstream level stay some stay humble and stack sets y'all um yeah. So you just put Biden in the you put Hunter Biden in the distraction psyop category. I would agree with that. Yeah. Um, and also the LK ninety nine thing is bullshit, right? I honestly I do not know. I tell uh, I'm, I'm that's where I, I'm at it right now. Where I'm like I never heard of superconductors before last week. Apparently well, they're like the hottest thing. Mark Marty. We're superconductor experts this week, um, <laughs> obviously, just like all everyone else. Um, I mean, no, that reeks of bullshit to me. But you know, maybe we'll all have pet unicorns in a couple months as a result. Yeah, I'm not. I honestly have no idea what to what to take of any of that. Um, Again, never heard of superconductors or LK99 before, like four <laughs> days ago. It's like some random <laughs> Korean paper comes out. And, um, and then people are like, we're going to have free energy. The whole world changes. Here's a here's a 20 tweet thread about how this changes everything. Um, not only are we not going to have a soft landing, and I think we've been pretty consistent on this. I don't know what the exact opposite of a soft landing is, but that's what we're going to have. Just like... Uh, <laughs> massive explosion <laughs> what is what is the opposite a so the opposite of a soft landing is just like everyone dies on the plane yeah no i had this discussion we did the uh pub key spaces it was me alex storn from galaxy thomas pacquia uh drew armstrong and mills and drew was trying to make the case that yeah it's probably going to be like uh the empire dies with a whimper like everything goes to shit, but slowly, but surely. But I don't know. Like if you look at, just look at the, um, 
we'll pull up this chart, but um, it'll be if you just look at the somewhere in the middle. Why do you say that? Gradually, then suddenly. I don't know. I just feel like that's uh, because I read mandibles, Marty. Because I read mandibles. But yeah. No, because like in mandibles, there's I I I think she bases it off of off of historical precedent and you have you have you know what's that quote like there's situations where years happen in weeks but then the majority of time is just a slow shitty grind down and so it'll be probably something along those lines right where there'll be particular weeks and where we remember like how crazy they were that will will change history but at the same time like the fall of an empire and the fall of all these institutions that we've built this empire on top of um, will mostly be like this slow crumble downward where most people will be in denial for, for large periods of time. Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if that happens, but like in terms of like the rapidness of the degradation in the sovereign markets, I think that will happen rather quickly towards the end of this year and we'll see yeah because like, i just see that too because it's like uh it's all a confidence game and it, well you that's know, like when you talk about like u.s u.s debt right and and seeing someone like fitch being the first mover here i mean obviously all the rating agencies are corrupt and complicit but uh that makes it even i think even even more relevant that they would downgrade the u.s and you can kind of see a situation where you have all this trust built up uh, through decades of, of mismanagement and corruption. Um, and when that trust starts to falter, things can move very quickly, right? Yeah. And that's where, I mean, again, we've talked about this many times over the years, but like, I think Jack was right. This hyperinflation is coming to eat or hyperinflation is here. I think we're in the middle of it and going back to like, why is it not only not going to be a soft landing, but an implosion because in the scenario where you have things going crazy in the sovereign debt markets and then energy ripping, which is the base input of our economy. So that's going to have rippling effects across prices in all industries that will increase the CPI. Even if the CPI is completely manipulated, it still cannot hide from, like energy price inflation, which bleeds into everything. And so that's where things get really heady is when you have the Fed would probably do one more rate hike if they're crazy enough or maybe pause. It'd probably be smarter for them to pause, but um, they've done this aggressive rate hike regime over the last two years to curl inflation at the tail end, right? When they think like, so we had 3.3% last month uh, the June numbers, we'll see what the July numbers come in. They'll probably be around the same area, I would imagine. But like when August numbers get printed, if oil keeps running, like, and the Fed yeah. takes a break in August, they don't have a meeting. They're not going to do anything with rates this month unless there's the need for an emergency meeting, which I don't see happening. But like come September's meeting, like, we could have CPI rising at the point where if things continue to go bad, with uh, the Japanese government bond market and here in the US, I mean, the 30 year is screaming above like 4.3% right now, um, which signals the market that they think inflation is going to be higher for longer. Um, but the Fed's going to have to step in to fix the debt problem to be the backstop for people offloading all these government bonds. And that's going to force them to cut rates and expand the monetary base at a time when it becomes abundantly clear that they did not actually in control inflation at the end of the day. And that's when the social aspect of hyperinflation comes in. It's like, oh my God, they worked so hard for two years to do all this. They really um, perturbed the economy, perturbed the real estate market, perturbed the jobs market, led to a bunch of bankruptcies and consolidation. And that wasn't even enough. Like we still had inflation and then that causes people to question, all right, they didn't solve inflation with a higher interest rate environment and like a, a quantitative tightening regime. Like 
and wait a minute, they're about to print more money and lower rates again. Like how bad is it going to get after that? That's when things I think could really accelerate. Yeah. They lose control of the situation. Yeah. The situation is already out of control. It's just most people are in denial. No. You know, I mean, I, I, yeah, I think we're approaching the point where it's undeniably out of control. And that's just like looking at the charts, like, look, and pull up the interest. Uh, that might be a peak clown call. I don't know. I think we live I'm, in a I'm not on the right? Like, I've, I've, I've thought it's been out of control for like five years now. Just like increasingly higher levels of out of control. Most people, most blue checks are just in complete denial still. I saw someone trying to fucking dunk on Dorsey the other day about his hyperinflation tweets still. We're still in that phase. I don't know. Maybe this time is different. <laughs> what chart do you want to bring Logan, up? I mean, I'm putting them in our ECAM chat, not Slack. Like this federal expense um, chart. I need to pull up the there, yeah. window. There it is. There it is. Yeah, so this, the latest data on this chart is only up to the end of Q2, so the end of uh, June. So we have to finish out this month and next month, and then we'll get an updated number. Uh, and remember, the Fed does not meet in August, so there's not going to be any interest rate changes. Just, uh, there's an emergency meeting, so like a pause or a cut in rates is not likely this month. And so you, you can imagine just by the nature of the rate hikes that they just made that this uh, chart will continue to go above $1 trillion uh, in interest payment expenditure from the government. And if you hover over like the last all time high in 2019, Q2 2019, it was like 591.636 uh, billion. And right now, if you go to Q2, to so like today, it's like 969.986. That's 63% growth in four years. And just the interest payments on the debt, that's doesn't even account for the actual debt, which has increased significantly. Um, obviously, that last all-time high was before COVID. Uh, and we've already grown the national debt by 10% this year. Like I mentioned earlier, the Treasury essentially wants to print about $2 trillion more of Treasuries between now and the end of the year. So we could finish the year with the national debt having rose like well over 15% year on year. Um, and like we're, we're getting into like exponential phase here. That's that's I think that's the point I'm trying to make. Once you get exponential phase, that, I think that's when people begin to wake up and realize because it's literally impossible not to stare at all stuff and all. So we should stay on bone stack sets. Yes, definitely, definitely. I like that plan. Yeah. I do wonder how long it's going to take, but we'll see. Yeah. I mean, John Doe saying in the comments, we might go into a deflationary recession. That's what I see coming. Could be wrong. Like I was, I, I was putting some credence behind that theory, like only a few weeks ago. But like with energy prices, and if you look at, it, and if you talk to anybody in the oil and gas market, they're like banging the drum, like we don't have enough production online to meet demand. Saudis are cutting their production. They just they recently made like a, a 1 million barrel a day reduction in their output. Again, we, we've completely emptied the SPR and then we don't have the production uh, follow up here. And that's what really sent prices skyrocketing this week. I think WTI is up another two and a half percent today is it, we took like a, a massive inventory draw, inventory draw that was unexpected uh, because the production's not there on the back end to to build up that inventory. And so like I was pricing pricing in the probability of a deflationary recession like relatively high uh, only a couple of weeks ago. But now with these energy prices ripping, like I think you have to throw that out the door because you can't just snap a finger and produce production 
overnight. Maybe Saudi Arabia can, but it doesn't seem like they want to play ball. Sorry, I was troubleshooting something, but um, yeah, no, I uh, look. I tend, I tend to agree. I think uh, we're kind of just been operating on borrowed time for a while now. So, at some point, that that breaks, um, and it's it's just really hard for me to just imagine. Period, uh, a a long term deflationary situation. Um, it seems like. It seems like uh, that's a trap that is is going to affect people on the right side of the I, IQ curve. Because I've seen a lot of smart yeah. people expect that. And I just don't really understand it. But maybe I'm wrong. Either way, my strategy is just going to be to stay humble and stack sets. Yeah. Like, how do you put the genie back know. in the bottle of, of, of the dollar being a shit coin? Like, are, like, once you lose trust in that, do you ever gain trust back? I don't think so. No, not when it comes to your money. Like, there's been attempts. I mean, Argentina and Venezuela, probably being the most popular, but I mean, they have gone through <laughs> hyperinflationary crises, made some insane policies, like adding digits to their their um, currencies or cutting digits from their currencies, cutting money out of circulation be like, all right, you can trust us this time. And then they rip into a hyperinflationary event again, almost immediately. Yeah. Like as soon as Just, people lose trust in this stuff, it's gone. Ugh. Beware freaks. Oh, Beware. God. What? Zap.stream chat. Come on. Guys. You, uh, you're watching that as well. I thought I was just being there. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, that's a questionable comment. Uh, but yeah, no censorship. I uh, I was having issue uh, pseudo Carlos in the zap.stream chat is asking me what I was distracted by. Um, well, first of all, the zap.stream in the beginning of the show didn't start because uh, I guess Kieran and Carnage, uh, the maintainers of zap.stream decided to add a terms and conditions that I had to accept. <laughs> So I, I troubleshooted that in the first five minutes. Um, Did you read all of them? No, I didn't. I just blindly accepted it. Uh, so hopefully, <laughs> hopefully that wasn't bad. Um, and now I'm trying to get Zaps to show again, because I guess we were using stacker.news, and I guess they're not showing it. Um but if you're if you're watching if you're watching through uh, zap.stream, which you can access via rhr.tv slash stream, if you could do me a favor, try and zap us right now and let's see if it shows in the chat. Yeah. <sighs> Sorry, Marty. What up? I was, it's all I, good. Was, I was focused on on things that would, would help the show. Help help our help the freaks. Yeah. All right. After that, uh a pretty dark open on the state of the global macroeconomic situation. Why don't we talk about some lighter hearted topics and your thoughts on, uh, on hex getting taken down by the SEC. I thought it was like a pivot into the UK government's attack on encryption, but, uh, no, no, we'll get back to that. Look, I, um, I, I don't love the idea of, um, the SEC picking winners or losers. Um, but, uh, I mean, Hex is, is one of the most blatant scams in the space period. Um, and, uh, massive fraud, no doubt took place. And a lot of retail got absolutely wrecked. And, uh, if they're going to go after anybody, like he should be top of the list. Um, so it's good to see on that front. I, it blows my mind, I'll, Marty. So many more people got ripped off on Hex than we even can comprehend. Like it was. Remember when Celsius happened? I was like, no one's, no one's dumb enough to get wrecked on Celsius. It was like so obvious. So many people got wrecked on Celsius. I think Hex is probably similar magnitude. I think it's even worse. I mean, I was saying this yesterday up in New York that like the quality of scammer is so low 
been like so obvious. They're ter- like the aesthetics of the scam world are terrible. Whether you're looking at Richard Hart or SBF or Mashinsky, it's all like che- cheap, second rate scammers. It, it, like you said, like I can't believe people were dumb enough to fall for this stuff. But yeah, there was a lot yeah. of people who fell. Don't like punching people when they're down, but learn from it. Uh, consider staying humble and stacking sats going forward. Yeah. What else? There was another thing in shitcoin world this week. Can't remember. Um, we're not here to talk about shitcoins. All right, back to uh, on. The, I mean, on the shitcoin topic, week. I do have on the list. Uh, Kenya blocked Worldcoin um, because they didn't want the citizens that. getting their eyeballs. Um, and uh, France, UK, and Germany are also investigating Worldcoin, considering banning it. Um, what um, did you see? They came out today and and now that they're going to data with governments that that would like that type of their data sharing partnership. Yeah, I mean, I think we already always knew that was going to come. Yeah, I think it was. I just think it was shocking how quickly it happened. Like a week after the main launch, like all right, governments come get all this information. Stop trying to ban us. We're we're on your side. We'll surveil <laughs> with you. <laughs> Uh, yeah the uh what do you think and then i saw like the co-founder not sam altman but the other co-founder worldcoin he was on some podcast explaining how they the worldcoin company basically creates a stable or at least uh doesn't allow the worldcoin token to trade volatile volatilely um and they they have like massive market makers that are just essentially <laughs> manipulating the price to a place where they think it should be at any given point in time. Yeah, so I mean, they, not actually, they it's spe- not actually a free market. They specifically built in part of the pre mine um, to loan to market makers um, for that reason, and so like a, a significant portion of the liquidity right now is. Uh, "Quote unquote World Coin Foundation approved market makers, um, which is obviously sketchy as fuck. Uh, and w- what we've seen in the past is if these things are traded in any kind of real way um, at any kind of real volume across different markets, uh, not just like one or two controlled markets, um, any attempt to peg a price or something like that will break drastically at some point. Um, and, and, and this will be no different. I mean, like there's been scams since, since the dawn of Bitcoin um, that have attempted to remove the volatility of uh, free market for shit coins and have ended in disaster. Do you remember Paycoin? Vaguely. 2015 OG scam uh, with Garza. He was like, yeah, yeah, everything yeah. will always be $20. He had like a cloud mining well, scam what, into it. Yeah, that's what like BitShare is trying to do too, right? They were like the first attempt at a stable coin. Yeah. Uh, but this wasn't a stable coin. This was uh, a coin that was supposed to go up in value, and and but with the floor of $20. That, that broke horribly. <laughs> But yeah, he was like one of the OG scammers. He like kind of set the book that was written, like uh, like that came after him with like Ethereum and the others. Yeah, the um, I mean, you said this in the past, but I think I agree with you now. Like the big crypto scam coin trend, this next cycle will probably revolve around Worldcoin and stacks, even though. And stacks, and even though they've had World Coins had their hiccups with Kenya coming out and saying, "Hey, get the hell out of our country," I do think they're beginning to position themselves as like the shit coin that's gonna butt up with governments. And I think there obviously have been some Ethereum to a certain extent has tried that in the past, but I think World Coin, famous Putin photo, yeah. But I think World Coin actually has a good chance of making some inroads of these governments, considering. 
like the success of open AI and right. the view. Governments can really relate to this idea of an orb scanning people's eyeballs. There's just something like innately comfortable with that to them. It's hard. It's hard to put my finger on it, but um, he know the, the, he's like automatically in the club uh, because they're like, "Oh, I see what you're doing here. This is promising. Like, how do we get our take? You know, how are we part of this?" But yeah, I think um, it's a little bit weird, right? Because um, I'm I'm I like. I will never own any world coin and I will never own any stacks period. Um, but I think that they're going to be pretty heavy in the, in the hype, this cycle. Like, I think, uh, it's going to be quite exhausting and annoying and frustrating. Um, but at least hex won't be a part of it. Yeah. And I'm still going to stand It's contrarian. I know you disagree, but I think the, uh, the shit coin scams, won't be as pronounced. Yes, maybe yeah. Worldcoin and Stacks have their day in the sun this next cycle, but I don't think you're going to have the breadth Marty, of... We have his deathbed in like 60 years, and there's going to be like a massive new shitcoin that's going to be launched, and everyone's going to be standing around him and like supporting his family and whatnot, and I'm just going to look at Marty and just be like, fucking told you so. <laughs> I don't know. I don't think so, man. I've got a, I've got a weird feeling about it. There's only um, three certainties in life: death, taxes, and more shit coins. <laughs> uh, I agree there will be more shit coins. Whether or not they'll have the success that they have had historically is what I'm questioning. I think there's so, a diminishing. I mean, like, they evolve. They evolve. I think. Um, I think the narrative of like Bitcoin killer is done, um, for the most part. Like people will still attempt to say something's a Bitcoin killer, um, but not to the same level of belief that uh, we've seen in the past. But that doesn't mean there's not going to be a bunch of like get rich quick, uh, like pump and dump schemes. Um, if we have truly free markets like Bitcoin wins, we have truly free markets, which is my expectation. Like, of course, there's going to be scammers and people that are greedy and then and then investors or quote unquote investors that 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 don't want to put the work in and, and want easy gains and 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 fuel the whole thing um i think this last cycle had really showed like those dgens aren't necessarily just people in in their parents basements like they can also be massive billion dollar hedge funds and venture funds and whatnot uh you know it's like the professionalization of the shitcoin scam space um but like if you want, like, as we've seen over time, like the shit coins evolve and adapt on top of each other, right? And I think like one of the reasons that Stacks is such a dangerous one is is because they they evolved cleverly, right? Like they have this forever ICO model that they call mining. Why do they call it mining? To intentionally gaslight anyone who criticizes it, even though it's not fucking mining. You're literally just sending Bitcoin and receiving the stacks token. It's a fucking ICO forever. But what else do they do, Marty? Like we have in this in this list, uh, we have that Brian Armstrong of Coinbase was told by the SEC that he has to delist all shit coins and only list Bitcoin. The Bitcoin is the only one that is potentially not a security. Well, what did stacks do way ahead of time? They registered their pre-mine <laughs> with the fucking SEC and it's a fucking legal security, right? Um, so there's evolutions in, in how they run the schemes and different layers of corruption that are that are used to to make these schemes feasible. But um, look, I would love to wake up tomorrow and just all the noise and distraction is gone. I just humans, humans, humans inherently fuel this shit. And I do appreciate that we have free markets. I'll, I'll take all this shit if we get truly free markets. And that's basically the grand compromise. It's like, you know, Freedom Tech enables all this shit, but it also enables like really powerful individual freedom oriented benefits. Um, and as a result, we'll be in a way better world. They'll just also be shitcoin scams. Yeah. I mean, Alex Thorne and I had a pretty long conversation about this last night. And I think we both agreed with each other and with what you just said is that like, it, let's not depend on the SEC to come in 
definitely don't cheerlead the SEC. The SEC is a terrible organization. And they actually let me fill me in on some like information that there's like a law that the SEC has in place uh, where they force the treasury to put in place. And it's really like hindering the ability for private and public companies to merge, like to do M and A um, for public companies to acquire privately traded companies, particularly if they're doing Bitcoin custody because they want, <clears throat> um, they want like custodians to uh, like use a particular accounting method that forces them to hold or not hold, but um, basically right in the assets that they're custodying on their balance sheet so to make it look like that it's their asset not their customer assets and so this has created a whole shit show where if any of these public companies want to acquire a private company the company essentially has to have uh one dollar in cuck bucks custodied for every one dollar in bitcoin like bitcoin at their custody yeah which is like an insane capital requirement that's never going to be met. And so that's preventing the industry from from moving forward at the public level, at least. Um, and then on top of that, yeah, like I completely agree. I, with all that said, that I don't think shit coins are going to um, be as successful as they were in the past. I think that's a product of the free market, people realizing that Bitcoin uh, is really the only thing with any value or validity at the end of the day and is beginning to prove that it has the functionalities that many of the shit coins that were spun up were saying that Bitcoin doesn't have or will never have. Um, but yeah, I don't, I'm not cheering for, even in the case of like Richard Hart, like he's an obvious scammer and yes, I'm sorry if you lost money, but also not sorry because if you couldn't tell that he was a massive scammer, like that's, that's on you and your lack of ability to, <laughs> to evaluate the emotional intelligence of the people that you're interacting with. Um, yeah. It's, yeah it's, I, I'm, you gotta take some personal responsibility, right? Yeah. Yeah. Clean up your act. And also like, gotta save you. You just gotta save yourself. And I definitely think there's a timeline where like, if the people cheerleading for the sec to clamp down on everything outside coin are successful, it could be like a short, lived victory because then like all the focus is for bitcoin and it's like they have more time to decide what to do with bitcoin and to fuck it up for us yeah the corrupt the corrupt politicians and regulators aren't going to stop with the shit coins they're yeah. also going to go after freedom money like it's yeah. it, it naturally follows and then yeah. you know if you cheered for the sec you have really no leg to stand on at that point Exactly. Um, we just have to hold our, you have to hold ourselves to a higher standard. We have to realize that pretty much every single person is a hypocrite to some level and look inwards, try and figure out where we're hypocritical and try and reduce that hypocrisy as much as possible because, um, because of personal responsibility, because if not us, then who, and if, if we don't actually practice what we preach, then how can we expect anyone else to? Yeah, completely agree. And like Matt said, they're they're going to come for freedom money. It should be obvious to anyone. They're coming for our freedoms over in the UK. They're really coming after your ability to chat in the end-to-end -end encrypted fashion. They're trying to get rid of encryption still in the UK. What is the uh, what's the bill called? The Online Safety Act or something like that? Such a good name. Online Safety Bill. You you don't do you not care about online safety? Why are you against online safety? Who doesn't want to be safe on the internet? The internet's a dangerous place. What uh again, I have to go to my cell phone to uh they want to pull back door. Up. They want a back door. We've we've talked about this in the past. They want a back door in all encrypted messaging apps. Um the war on encryption never ended. Uh, it's been waging since the early 90s and the late 80s. Um, and um, Freedom Tech and open source software fixes this. Uh, they can they can ban it. Um, it would fucking suck. It will only hurt law-abiding, honest people. Um, criminals will still find a way to communicate privately. 
I know it's amazing. It's really crazy. Like blows your mind when I say that out loud. That's insane that they'll still figure it out. Um, but uh, you know, open source software is viral. It it, it survives bans. There's no company or uh, individual that you can pressure to stop its distribution. Cat's out of the fucking bag. So they're not going to be able to stop encryption. They're not going to be able to stop people from using open source software to use encryption. But they, what they can do is they can make it way out of reach for the average person to enjoy the benefits of encryption. Apps like Signal, even apps like WhatsApp that uses the Signal protocol and is run by Facebook and I don't trust it for shit, like has encryption built into it. Uh, apps like iMessage, which I also don't trust for shit, has encryption built into it. This bill would mandate that any of those companies, if they were into to to um, to serve UK customers, serve British customers, they would have to implement a backdoor so that that encryption could be broken, so that the people can be surveilled. And what we've seen is, anytime there is a backdoor, anytime there is a vulnerability, it is it is a centralized vulnerability. It is a it is a central point of failure. It will get. Uh, it, it, they will get pressured, it will get leaked, it will get shared. It is, it, malicious actors will take advantage of it. There's no such thing as a safe backdoor. If any, I mean, they're calling this a backdoor, but it's really more of a fucking front door. But anyway, um, this, is, this, is, this is bad for every UK citizen. And it makes, it makes, it makes the UK more vulnerable to their enemies um, as a country. It hurts the whole fucking country. And it's incredibly short-sighted and sucks to see. But this is why uh, the freedom tech movement is so important, because we can't rely on corrupt politicians, corrupt regulators to protect our freedoms. Um, but we can rely on code and we can rely on open source contributors that that continue to push this movement forward. Yeah, it's pretty astonishing. Look, I'll stay on this section because I think this highlights either these politicians in... The United Kingdom are extremely ignorant or just extremely disingenuous, probably a combination of both. Um, so in response to this outpouring of resistance, the UK government's response has been to wave its hands and deny reality. In a response letter to the House of Lords seen by EFF, the UK's Minister for Culture, Media and Sport simply rehashes an imaginary world in which messages can be scanned while user privacy is maintained. We have seen companies develop such solutions for platforms with end-to-end -end encryption before, the letter states. A reference to client-side scanning. Ofcom should be able to require the use of such technologies and where off-the-shelf solutions are not available. It is the right of the government. It is right that the government has led the way in exploring these technologies. Uh, the minister completes his response on encryption by writing, we expect the industry to use its extensive expertise and resources to innovate and build robust solutions for individual platforms and services that ensure both privacy and child safety by preventing child abuse content from being freely shared on public and private channels. So they're wrapping this one in the protect the children wrapping paper. Always. But you don't yeah. care about online safety. The, ir the irony, the irony that the online safety bill will make the internet less safe for most people is not lost on me, but it's great uh, narrative propaganda narrative. Yeah. No, it'll be interesting because it'll be important to watch if this bill gets signed into law, which it seems like it's probably going to be. It's at the final stage. Uh, it got through, I guess, the equivalent of their house and their Congress, and it's just waiting to be signed into law, or maybe there's one last vote. But it will be interesting to observe. <laughs> there's one more vote. I don't understand their politics, but there's one more vote. Neither do I. We, uh, we left like the EFF left country. Imploring, the, the EFF is imploring that day um, that they denied in the last vote, but it's not going to happen. Signal has said that they, I believe Signal's stance is they will remove themselves from the UK market if this is the case. By the way, when I was talking about last week on, on the fact that Signal and, and Simple X are complementary to each other, um, part of it is this reason. Is right like if if governments don't uh through through poor regulation malicious regulation go after a centralized company like signal who's running a server signal offers a lot of convenient benefits to people 
But if they do go off after a, a, a signal, uh, you know, like a project like Signal, then you know you start to move to projects like SimpleX that allow you to self-host your own server that you don't have to rely on a on a, a company or a nonprofit to run a centralized server, right? So it's important that we have defense in depth. It's important that we have projects that are incredibly convenient to use and have some measured trusted third party that is ideally trust minimized because you get convenience benefits out of it, you get cost benefits out of it. But in 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 worst case scenarios and scenarios where we see many world governments all attack these central point of failures at the same time, it's important that we have tools like Bitcoin, like Noster, like SimpleX that, that are robust from this pressure. Maybe they're a little bit less convenient than the centralized alternatives, but they're robust and they can, they can withhold this kind of pressure. And so I, I consider that defense in depth and you start to see people move down that stack as the pressure builds. Um, and that's kind of how I'm watching this whole thing play out. Yeah. Shout out to Signal for signaling that they'll leave if this gets passed. But I mean, keep an eye like this could be a canary in the coal mine of companies like Apple and other big services that are promising end to end encrypted chat or just end to end encryption generally within their services don't leave. That should be a signal that maybe. I'd be very surprised if Apple left. It should be actually interesting to see. If anything, it, you know, the accelerationist in me, you know, let's see it get passed and see how Apple responds. Well, that would, I mean, honestly, I mean, that's been the big sort of focus of Apple's ad campaigns over the last couple of years is privacy. Like, if they don't leave, and we shit on Apple a lot. Obviously, we don't like the walled garden of the App Store, but. This could be an instance where if they do truly care about privacy and want to make a, a message and use their influence as a corporation to sort of send a message to the UK government, like if they pulled out and the UK government was sitting there like, oh shit, nobody's going to get an iPhone in our country. Like imagine the backlash that would ensue for individuals. So you have to imagine to like, put the this people on the ground in the UK. To put this into context. Uh, iMessage is end-to-end -end encrypted. So when when you say end-to-end -end encrypted, um, I mean, iMessage is an open source. Apple is an open source. Uh, iPhones are an open source. Um, so it's hard to verify claims. There are researchers that like sniff data that is going through the network to see like what information is being transferred and stuff. So there are ways to at least soft verify, but but it, it's, it's significantly harder with closed source software. But all that said, iMessage is end-to-end -end encrypted. So if I have an iPhone and Marty has an iPhone and we send an iMessage between the two of us, um, both of our iPhones have the encryption key that uh, decodes the message. Anyone in between that knows that we had communication with each other. They don't know what the contents of the message are, right? They know the encrypted message happened. They don't know what we're talking about unless they have access to the individual iPhones. Now, the way Apple has it set up, though, is if you back up, if one of us, let's say Marty backs up his iMessage chats to iCloud, it is no longer end-to-end -end encrypted, and they can hand that information over. And the overwhelming majority of people that use iMessage back it up to iCloud. So as long as one participant in that group chat or private message is backing up to iCloud, they already essentially have that backdoor. Um, and up until this point, they've kept that as a status quo. We know the US government has used that in the past um, to go after people. Um, so it's like I said, it should be interesting to see how they necessarily respond to this. And WhatsApp has a similar issue. I believe WhatsApp by default does it. I don't know if iMessage by default backs up to iCloud. I think it does. I know WhatsApp by default backs up to iCloud and Google Drive. Um, and yeah, so that is that is the that is the crux of the issue, right? The crux of the issue is is that you can't truly have privacy if there's a way for a centralized actor to get access to the data. Um, and 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 governments obviously want you know their incentives are 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 set up to treat us all as, as subjects and, and try and have as much data as possible. And Marty, you said earlier, like, 
Is it malevolence or is it uh, ignorance? And it's probably a combination. Um, I saw a post the other day about U.S. Congress. U.S. Congress is the oldest it's ever been. Uh, our politicians in America are the oldest they've ever been by far. If you want to talk about uh, a hockey chick, hockey hockey stick chart, like look at the age of of, of U.S. Congress. In Britain, it's probably similar, based on similar incentives. Um, you know, most of our politicians can barely send an email. They can bar barely use their iPhone. You know, maybe some of them actually do believe that that uh, you can do this in a quote unquote secure way. But it's all wrapped in this malevolence that is they think they have the right to surveil every single thought and conversation we have, which is fucking insane and should be pushed back against. Yeah. What do we call them? Genoctitarians? Is that the phrase? Gerontocratians? Yeah, that geritocracy. Is, what they, is, is that what they call it? Yeah. Geritocracy? Um, I have pseudo Carlos in uh, the Nostar comments saying false, all caps, exclamation point. If you enable advanced data protection, then the backups are encrypted. Okay, we'll go into settings and enable advanced data protection. Um, Marty, do you have that enabled? I don't know. Go enable it. So I don't know if I have iCloud enabled. Gerontocracy. 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 The thing is, is like it's 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 helpful if they do have a setting, but what really matters is defaults. It's always defaults. Defaults are the real. Defaults are what really matters, um, because most people will go with however the default is, and I don't speak like I know if that's the default or not, but it sounds like the way Carlos mentioned it. It is not the default. Um, and that's intentional. And Apple, Apple has gaslit privacy advocates when they say, why isn't it default? And they say, because uh, our customers can't practice personal responsibility. And if they lose access to iCloud, they're going to contact support and be like, yo, why can't I access iCloud? Like reset my account. Um, and I just think that's a, you know, a little bit of a cop out and a little bit of a commentary on on society that is incredibly sad, which is um, that, you know, one of the world's most valuable companies doesn't think their customers have enough personal responsibility to access their data. I agree. <laughs> uh, Carlos is responding in the chat saying it's not a default. Um, I just found out it's not default. And they have a lot. Did you just enable it? Yeah. Good. Go enable it. If you use if you use iOS, go enable it. This is uh incredibly actionable. And thank you, Carlos, for letting us know, even though you were wrong about morning rips. Um, we appreciate your contributions to the live chat week in and week out. We have John Doe in the YouTube comments with a great quote from Phil Zimmerman. If privacy is outlawed, only outlaws will have privacy. Timeless quote. It's like, how do these people not get that yet? They don't care. I know the answer. That's a, it's a mix of malevolence and um, like there's 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 bad intentions there. There's power hungry bad intentions, but it's also ignorance. I mean, there's some Congress people that don't even write their own emails. They have like their assistant. They like dictate to their assistant and their assistant like prints out the emails and like hands them the printouts. They barely use their fucking iPhones. They're like probably trying to like FaceTime their grandkids and you can't like they can't even like get the camera to function and, and they can't even figure out how to fucking switch cameras from the front or the back camera or whatever. Like the gap is so fucking huge and it's a danger to our country and to other countries. I mean, this is a global show. Diane, Diane Feinstein didn't even know how to fucking vote the other week. She had ever AIDS. So be like, no, just say I. Like, <laughs> like yeah. she literally forgot how to vote. Yeah, <laughs> that should be a that should be a sign, but alas.
just set up. What are you doing over there? Are you like texting friends and family to all enable advanced backups? You're like looking um, through your message history to see like what's been out there. Yes. <laughs> I've got wait. Give me one second. I'm doing my recovery, Kay. Look, there's it's, Marty's backing up his his iCloud live on air. Um consider enabling that feature. Also consider once again, I think signal is a great balance of trade-offs. I'm not saying it's perfect, you know. There's a bunch of there's there's metadata that compromises you. It requires, um, <laughs> it it requires a phone number. Simple X is great. I really like Threema. Threema is solid. If you go to Odell.xyz, um, I have all my contact information there for Threema and, and Simple X. I don't put Signal there because of the phone number requirement. But I've just moved a large portion of my friends and family over to Signal. Um, you get a lot of the benefits of just what a top tier messenger should interact with, like how it, how it should work. Um, but you get just really sane user friendly defaults on the privacy and freedom side. Um, so if you just use signal, you will get massive improvements net net. Now, I'm not saying it's perfect. Um, but, uh, you, you, you do get uh, serious. We have UTXO in the chat saying he only has one person on Signal. I've communicated with you on Signal. Am I the only person? I think is a reasonable question to ask. Um, and funny story, UTXO, during the last Rabbit Hole recap, we started talking about Simple X, and he sent me a Simple X invitation via Signal. Uh, so we've just crossed over between episodes and topics. Are you set up, Marty? Am I going to still keep talking? <laughs> BPC pins. Politicians are too old. How does my phone work? Marty. <laughs> oh, my phone works. BPC <laughs> <you see> pins. <laughs> <laughs> we all know. I mean, we had, the meme hasn't been brought up in quite some time, but I am a boomer at heart. Apparently, I'm the only person that UTXO communicates with on Signal. Be that person. Be the only person for people. Yeah. All right. Advanced recovery key set up. You're, you're good? Um, we're secure? We're good. We're secure. Nice. Uh, being old doesn't, you can't figure things out. Maybe it's just being a politician and being lazy. No, like Joe Biden, uh, Mitch McConnell, and Dianne Feinstein literally have no idea where they fucking are. I think it should be pretty obvious to you people. And like also, like, you just named three corrupt old people like sympathies to the non-corrupt old people it's difficult out there it's fucking confusing like my grandmother like <laughs> overnight <laughs> she figures out how to work her iphone but it's fucking confusing and difficult for her like that is to be expected like i don't hold that against her she's just not running our country it's okay it's reasonable yeah, I mean, you can imagine us in like 15 years trying to figure out how the superconductor works and we're just like, what the hell is going on here? Where's my free electricity? Yeah, I don't want our kids like quoting RHRs from like 20 years previously and being like, dad, you know, you you were ragging on the old people, so now I can rag on you. Like, we're, I'm pro old people, just not when they're corrupt old people that are telling us how to live our lives. I'm pro old people too. And I also like to think when I become an old person, I'd, ha I'd have the grace and the humility to be like, yeah, I don't know what's going on. Maybe I shouldn't rule the country. Maybe I shouldn't uh, be sitting in this chair anymore. That's, that's what we should have named the episode in hindsight. We're like an hour in now, but we should have named it. We're pro old, pe old people. <laughs> Odell and Marty come out pro old people, just not corrupt old people. Yeah. If you get to a certain point and you, you can't even remember how to vote after you've been there for like 30 years like it's time to hang it up the Maybe main even longer i think she, how long has diane feinstein been in office it's 1992 yeah for 31 years that's crazy yeah it's my it's whole almost, life essentially 
almost three bitcoins ago. It's more than two bitcoins ago. I said almost three. I, I like to push it, be more provocative. I mean, it's closer to two than three if we're being accurate here. Provocative. <laughs> um, what else do we have on the list? Back to Coinbase. <laughs> Seems like Brian Armstrong yeah. got ratioed so hard by Jack Dorsey that they're going to explore implementing Lightning. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's two Coinbase stories. We touched on one, which was that Br Brian Armstrong said the SEC said they had to stop interacting with everything but Bitcoin. And it basically forced his hand because it destroys their entire business model of dumping shit coins on retail. So they had to fight them. Um, and he's like, it made the decision really easy because it would destroy that business model. Um, and then separately, uh, as Marty said, Jack Dorsey ratioed um, Brian Armstrong when he asked on Twitter, um, looking into crypto payments and integrating crypto payments more on uh, Coinbase, do anyone have any recommendations on like which chains we should support? Um, and uh, Jack was like, why not Lightning? This is a, what's on the screen right now is a, like a second, second tweet from him. But, um, and so now they've announced uh, that they are looking to integrate it. Uh, they don't know how they're gonna integrate it, but they're exploring their options. Um, yeah. Well, that's like, it's very hand wavy. And that's like the frustrating thing about it. It's like, all right, we'll implement it, but then do like in typical shit coiner fashion. Like it's so hard to do where I think he got responses from like Bitfinex and a couple others. It was like, it took us like Bitfinex, especially like probably has um, like the most weight behind their statement because of how big their exchange is. Obviously it's not Coinbase scale, but it's pretty large. And they were like, yeah, it took us one engineer in one week of his work to get it implemented like there's no excuses i think i think to be clear it's not necessarily easy to implement lightning in a user-friendly way um that minimizes support requests that minimizes risk to the exchange of losing money um it is definitely significantly more difficult to implement than on-chain bitcoin um a lot of the shit coins uh are, are they inherit certain similarities to on-chain Bitcoin in terms of implementation um, or they have similarities to ETH. So after they do all the infrastructure improvements for ETH and they like add all that burden to support ETH, supporting the ETH derivative shit coins aren't that much more difficult. But in practical senses, like no one's asking Coinbase to reinvent the wheel. I'm not even asking Coinbase to run their own node. Um, like there are plenty of companies that would uh, kill for the opportunity to be the lightning service provider for Coinbase and make fees off of that. Um, and Coinbase can just go out and hire one of those companies uh, to integrate. Like they could, they could literally integrate it in, in days uh, because they don't have to have their own entire stack uh, to do it. Yeah, completely agree. But I did it up river. So I saw uh, I saw Francis from Bull Bitcoin mention and 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 just appreciate like the difficulties of of integrating Lightning on their side, um, which it, it's it's not as straightforward as people make it out to seem because you have these different trade offs that are made, um, and like the. In Bull Bitcoin, it was a little bit different because Bull Bitcoin is a self custody first exchange. They have no custodial option. It's way easier to implement Lightning in a custodial way. So they have to deal with payment failures. They have to deal with, you know, customers not having the liquidity in a good spot and like all this other shit. Like there's all these different little edge scenarios that you have to deal with when implementing Lightning. Um, but yeah. In this particular sense, it's all bullshit for the most part because Coinbase has just prioritized dumping shit coins on retail that are connected to A16Z and their other investors. Um, and that's why their priorities have been where their priorities are. Yeah. Uh, what's the over under? 
date for when they get it implemented in your mind? Are we making a bet? The real question is, Marty, uh, what happens first, a mempool's clear or um, Coinbase implement Lightning? Because the real pressure for Coinbase to implement Lightning is mempool's never clearing. Uh, when when users start having to pay very high on-chain fees, they're going to get really mad if Coinbase does not have Lightning. I think mempool's going to clear first. Yeah, I mean, that's what we expect to that was like a pretty easy a good, for you. This could be a good hedge bet for me too. It's not a good hedge bet because I'm not going to take it. No, it is a good hedge bet. Your base is going to take a long fucking time to 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 add lightning. No, it's a good hedge bet. I'm down. I'm down for a hundred thousand sats if you're in. A hundred thousand sat. What are we currently at? We're two hundred thousand. Memphis so, clear before Christmas. And you owe me nothing if they don't, but then I no yeah. longer owe you 200 sets, 200,000 sets. Yes. Okay. So this is just an additional 100,000 sets. Yeah. So mempool is clear before Christmas and Unchained, or excuse me, not Unchained, Coinbase uh, has not implemented Lightning. Why hasn't Unchained integrated Lightning yet? That's a good question. We should be hassling them too. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I yeah, uh, yeah. If that's more clear before Christmas and Coinbase has it implemented lightning at the same time, I get 300,000 sets. We, okay, okay. So now it's the Christmas bet. Okay, so but if Coinbase implements no, like I'm just No, I'm saying like two it's a good separate bet for me. Two yeah. separate. Okay. So 100,000 uh, sets. Sets. I say Coinbase, I say Coinbase implements lightning before mempool's clear again. And you say okay. after mempool's clear, right? After mempool's clear, yes. And to be clear, I'm doing this bet out of my conviction that mempool's will not clear again, not my conviction that Coinbase is going to implement lightning in the time <laughs> matter. Because who the fuck knows how long that's going to take. Okay, okay, deal. Deal. Nice. nice. <laughs> All right. We've got a hard stop in 30 minutes. We both just drop a nice at the same time. You have a hard stop in 30 minutes? We both. Do we both? Did it happen after we went on air? I could get my time zones mixed up. I don't see no, it. Yeah. On my you should. Okay, I'll trust you. I'll trust your judgment. Oh, I see. Um, yeah, it's my calendar, but some of my messages. Yeah. Okay, so let's cover this. Let's go. We got a huge list to go with. I didn't see this, so let us know what happened here. Bitcoin ATM firm Biddy takes on Swiss regulator for an undemocratic KYC limits. I like this. Yeah, more of this. Let's push back against all this bullshit. Enough is enough. I want to see more Agreed. Bitcoin companies standing up. Stand up. Protect your customers. Protect your company. Protect your rights. It's important. Uh, next on the list, this is pretty big. Pretty big topic that's going underappreciated, I think, outside of very niche Bitcoin cir circles. But Tether bought another uh, 1,529 Bitcoin in Q2. They hold more U.S. treasuries than Australia and a few other countries as well. And I believe their profits on their treasury holdings right now are sitting at $1 billion per quarter. And will probably be higher if rates are going higher. They're interacting with the reverse repo window too. Yeah, so, so they're like, taking it right now. Yeah. I mean, their net profits were like $1 billion in Q2. And like to compare that, I think BlackRock's net profits were like 1.8 billion over the same time period, and that yeah, is right. in name, especially especially when you consider like the overhead that comes with BlackRock, the amount of uh, employees they have, the amount of AUM they have, like, and then you compare that to Bitfinex, which is a relatively lean company, from what I understand, like it's pretty 
impressive. Like, obviously, there's a bunch of people who don't like Bitfinex because of Tether. Um, or Bitfinex and Tether are separate, right? So Bitfinex no, and Tether the Tether same Tether. people. Bitfinex and Tether are I essentially mean, the same people. They pretend it's different. Yeah, the same people. Yeah. Look, no one should hold Tether. I will never hold Tether. Anyone who holds Tether, I won't say no one should hold Tether. Anyone that holds Tether should know that it could go to zero at any moment because it's completely centralized. Um, but they are quickly becoming one of the largest central banks in the world. And they're privately <laughs> held, uh, with very few employees, as Marty stated. Um, so they've been increasing their Bitcoin holdings. Uh, they've been increasing... They've been increasing their Bitcoin holdings with spare revenue. So it's not like they're backing Tether with Bitcoin. They're mostly backing it with treasuries, as Marty said. They're, ro um, they're rolling profits from the treasury trade into Bitcoin, stack, essentially. To stack Bitcoin um, because they, they don't want uh, MicroStrategy to have more Bitcoin than them. That was another thing. I mean, MicroStrategy... Just this year, well, there's seven hundred fifty million dollars in new stock issuance to buy more Bitcoin. Yeah, they're, I don't know they're if they executed that buy yet. I think, as of yesterday's prices, if they piled all that money in to Bitcoin, they would add like another twenty five some odd thousand to their balance sheet. Like uh, it's twenty really poor. It's like twenty years from now, like the three most valuable companies in the world are are Tether, MicroStrategy, and fucking Block One. The EOS block now. one, god damn it! <laughs> this is the timeline we deserve. Should we have just run an ICO back in 2017? Yeah, dude, stack 300,000 Bitcoin. Never launched a podcast. <laughs> so, yeah, podcast is not as uh, lucrative as shit coining or running a stable coin fund. That's, if uh, anything, like maybe dangerous. this cycle, this cycle, maybe we should just pivot to a shitcoin podcast and get like quarter million dollars a month in like scam sponsors. Yeah, but then then we'd have to cry when one of the the sponsors rugs all of our our listeners. And well, I don't want to cry on air. Only David cried. Ryan just looked there, <laughs> straight face, was like, "This was the plan the whole time, David. Like, why are you crying?" So only one of us needs to cry. <laughs> the other person just uh, needs to I, cry. I go bad. So, <laughs> uh it's a tough look tough look yeah everyone was like honing in on david crying the real take from that was just ryan just being just completely straight faced was like i've already i've already sold my soul this is exactly what i was planning on doing <laughs> yeah <laughs> suck it up pussy <laughs> and, then, and then the best part is the ads are still scrolling like below. Yeah, it's like all scam yeah. ads on the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> oh god, the space. It's hilarious. Yeah. Um I've been hearing someone use rewards rewards bug on Stacker News to withdraw 20 million sats. Yeah, this sucks. Um Keon released an update, and the update showed that everyone on Stacker News received uh, massive Bitcoin rewards. Uh, like, if you're a, a user on Stacker News, you get rewards for interacting with the site. The rewards were completely skewed incorrectly. I think it was like 800, over 800 Bitcoin in rewards was handed out in the UI. Um, and one of the early Stacker News users um, took the opportunity to withdraw 20 million sats. So, to be clear, Keon knows who the user is. Uh, the bug has been fixed. He's hoping the user comes forward and just gives the money back. He said he'll give it to the community in form of actual rewards over the next few months. Um, Keon is one of the founders of Pleb Lab in Austin. He's a fantastic builder. Uh, all that said, Stacker News is a fucking awesome project. Uh, it's incredibly easy to use and convenient to use. Um, but this just goes to show, once again, the issues with custodianship and being custodian. I would never want to be a custodian. I would never wish it on uh, my enemies, uh, let alone my friends, uh, to have that liability on your plate. Uh, not only are you vulnerable to centralized corrupt actors that might pressure you like uh, governments, um, but you are also more vulnerable to these types of situations where you know, all your profits from a whole year could get wiped out in a single vulnerability because someone withdrew more money from you than you were expecting. 
So um, if you're a builder out there, uh, it's prudent you try and build on self-custody as a foundation. Um, and if you're an open source contributor to Lightning, to the many Lightning implementations and different projects in the Lightning ecosystem, please realize what a pain point it is uh, for for low friction, easy to use, self-custody Lightning. It's so difficult that uh, many of these projects are uh, choosing to go the custodial route uh, rather than add friction for their users. Beware, freaks. Beware. Shout out to Keon, everybody at Stacker News. And if you're the person who drained that wallet, took advantage of that bug, uh, 20, 20 million sats isn't worth it for your reputation. I'd, I'd give them back. Um, Just give it back. He knows who you are. Um, yeah, they're gonna they're gonna send a gang of homeless people after you if you don't. We got some of the craziest ones in Austin, so <laughs> um, we don't have to dive too deep into this. But Spiral uh, released a quarterly update Q3, talking yeah, about LDK, about BDK. But uh, go Bitcoin read that. They do a really good job with their updates. Spiral's doing a lot of great. Sh- great shit in the ecosystem and i just appreciate how transparent and open they are while they're building all this stuff so um yeah go check yeah. it out uh and then from there geyser has integrated apps and launches grants for bitcoin educational communities um so there's two pretty big updates for geyser if you're leveraging geyser fund i know matt is leveraging that for Citadel Dispatch, if you go and you want to donate to No Bullshit Bitcoin, they use it too. Um, go check it out. I think what's really cool here is just open standards, right? So Zaps use LN URL as an open standard. Um, like, Geyser doesn't have to like go to like Noster leadership and be like, I want to implement Zaps shown on our uh, crowdfunding page. If they just implement the open standard and now all of a sudden if you zap one of these projects on Noster and they're already on geyser.fund, like it'll just show up in the same in the same flow. You'll show up on the leaderboard. Your message will show up if you put a message in your zap. This is why open standards win. Agreed. No need to collaborate with API calls or anything like that. Exactly. A bunch of, a bunch of meetings. Getting the team, meeting in person. Legal documents. No. Oh, let my lawyer redline this. Okay, now my lawyer re-redline this. No, now that my lawyer re-redline. Like, none of that bullshit. Just open standards for the win. Beautiful thing. All right, before we get on to software updates, uh, top four boosts from Rabbit Recap 263, resist the orb. It seems that people are resisting the orb. The, the leadership uh, in Kenya listened to last week's episode and quickly and swiftly moved to resist the orb. So we're very proud. Of our they just want the orb. For, for they the just want, they just, they're just trying to get Sam to bend the knee and give them, give them that sweet, sweet data. Hopefully I'm wrong. Hopefully Kenya resists the Kenyan government. Dude, it's even, Kenyan people are great. They can go fuck themselves still. It's using zero knowledge proofs. Dude. They don't even have the data. It's not That's even there. A, this is like the fucking gall of shitcoin scammers, right? It's like, okay, you want to launch your like death store, death, death star fucking eye scanning orb on people and like, scam them out and have this massive pre mine and make a shit ton of fucking money off of their na- naivety and like off of their privacy and their private data. Like, okay. But like they go above and beyond that. Like they do that and they're also like, but we're the privacy focused alternative. It's like, <laughs> It's like, just fucking own it. But the gall of shit corners, they have to just take it to that next level. They have to just be like, this is this is the best world ID. This is privacy preserving. This is the best. If you, if, if you hate world coin, you hate privacy. And they just take it to the fucking extreme. Agreed. And top four boost, starting with Spaniel. Education, education, education. I'm teaching Bitcoin at a university. This is great to hear. And that was a boost for 77,777 sats. Sevens across the board, palindrome boost. 
Thank you for your service, uh, sir. Yeah, thank you for your service. Mold the young minds. We need to uh, rid the university system with the 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 brain rot that has been pervasive. I don't. I'm not sure where you're teaching, but it's certainly happening here in the United States. But I'm sure it's students everywhere could learn. About it. It's probably happening where he's teaching as well. Yeah, that's actually. Uh, I had this discussion yesterday too. TSMC, they've broken ground on their foundry in Arizona. I'm not sure if you saw the line, but it, it describes the utter state of the U.S. education system. They literally couldn't hire American engineers to actually build a system. They had to import, I, think, I believe, 10,000 engineers from Taiwan to actually get shit done. <laughs> they couldn't find the talent here in the United States. That is incredibly disheartening, not surprising. And I would suggest to them, though, in the future, if they need to like keep track of those IDs, like WorldCoin could be a really great privacy-preserving way for them to track those people when they come in to work here. It's true. It's true. It's for the privacy. Second <laughs> boost from what 236 at 8 Myth Randir, 77,767 sats. Sevens across the board, palindrome boost. Rehar from Stack Wallet was considering implementing border wallets on mobile and meaning the HRF bounty. He reached out to HRF checking the terms for making the bounty claim and was told this. Do be aware that the bounty specifies the wallet must be popular. I would recommend looking into integrating the functionality into popular open source wallets. Stack Wallet has already integrated Paynim and is available on Android, iOS, and desktop. Thanks. Um... <laughs> must be I, hey, we're not popular. I love the Stack Wallet project. Um, the biggest concern, the biggest issue I've had with the Stack Wallet project, which is fully open source, um, was that they have had they have many shit coins that are supported, which is not just an ideological issue, um, which it is, uh, but it's also a functional issue. It makes it more difficult for users to use, and it 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 it's a concern with priorities. Um, so what they did was they released Stack Duo, which was just Bitcoin and Monero and cut off a lot of the noise out of out of the wallet, um, which I appreciated. Uh, I think, you know, personally, if I was in charge of the bounties, they should be awarded for this. Um, they obviously qualified for the BIP47 bounty that was released, by the way, out after RHR, I believe they added the BIP47 bounty um, to the list of bounties, which I think is a great bounty. Um, and the border wallets, I mean, I, I was, I was reading along on telegram the other day and they have a very novel idea of the implementation of border wallets. They want to make border wallets slightly less secure, um, but easy to, easier to remember than current border wallets, the, the current border wallet spec as implemented in Sparrow, which by the way, is a really clean implementation of, uh, the border wallet spec relies on this matrix that you like print out. And they want to do it without the matrix so you can truly just remember what you need to remember across the border and then sweep it. And they think that this idea that even if that's a slightly less secure and you have slightly less entropy, because it's so it's it's so immediate and you're not really holding funds in there for very long, uh, the benefits outweigh the cons of that. So I'm really intrigued by what they released there. Um, yeah, I mean, we said last week. This was my major concern. Uh, this was my major concern with how HRF had set up their bounties, which is the awarding process is very is a little bit vague and, and leaves it up to their own decision, which is their prerogative. Um, but it's not a position that I would want to be in where I have to essentially decide who gets money and who doesn't on a, a little bit more of a subjective fashion. And then last but not least, uh, I'm going to talk my own book. I'm a co-founder of OpenSats. Uh, if you're listening to this, consider applying for a grant from OpenSats. It's good that we have many different options for open source development funding. Yeah, I saw James O'Byrne posting a thread today, sending the message out to core developers. It's great to see. Gigi has been absolutely crushing it. So here's my weekly shout out to Gigi, our fearless leader, uh, working full time to make OpenSats the most effective open source funding mechanism in the world. Let's go. Top th number three boost from last week at user 303 50,000 sats. Stay humble, stack sats. Good advice. 
Great maybe advice. Eric nine nine. Maybe maybe Eric nine nine didn't didn't <laughs> sign in. Um, at BTC JT, fourth top boost of the week, fifty thousand sats. I don't like to cuss, but Barry Silver is Garbo. <laughs> I don't think he cussed. Garbo is not a fucking cuss. Barry Silver <laughs> is a fucking scammer. There you go. There you go. Thank you for boosting the podcast. If you're listening via podcasting 2.0 app, if you're listening live on the stream via zap.stream and you're zapping us, thank you. Also, shout out to our sponsors, Unchained and Kite. Go check out their products. We believe heavily in them. Um, thank you guys for supporting the show. We're going to wrap really, it up here. You keep us going. Yeah. We've got... Uh, What do we have left? We have, I got to figure out. Like we 50. Slack. Do you yeah. want me to read them out? Yeah, Cause... you can read them out. You know, I, I'll tell you where to stop. <laughs> <That's> just, <laughs> you're so excited. You're so excited. That's usually my privilege. Uh, Thunderhub V0.13.20 is out. Peach Bitcoin V0.2.12 is out. It adds Lightning and Bitcoin swaps peer to peer. Um, really great to see. We have BTC Pay Server V1.11.1 is out. Correct some of the bug fixes in the update that we mentioned last week. There was a couple bugs uh, in the last major release, so that fixes that. Uh, Zeus V0.7.7 is out. Um, there's also another bug fix release, adds fixes and improvements. Civkit Arage is out, which is an LDK-based lightning node with a focus on availability, modularity, and security. Um, this is uh, proceeding with uh, a phenomenon we've seen where, where different teams are basically packaging LDK and building it into a full package Um for end users to to run and 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 builders to build on top of easier than and just using uh, the LDK library, which is fantastic to see. We have Blockstream Jade V1.0.21 out that adds better navigation and readability. We have Blink, which was formerly the Bitcoin Beach Wallet V2.2.105, adds LNURL pay codes. Um, Blink is a uh, collaborative custody model uh, where a community is essentially using a multi-sig custodian uh, to make it easier to interact with Bitcoin, but at least you know your custodian because they're local is the is the concept. Uh, it was it was proved out in Bitcoin Beach. Um, and this idea of these LN URL pay codes, these static QR codes uh, that people can pay, whether that's a merchant or someone else is a major feature. So it's great to see them add that here. Uh, we have mini beats, mini bits v0.0.17 alpha. That is a cashew uh, Charmin eCash implementation uh, app um, that adds, you know, different features that cashew does not have. Presumably, um, good to see another Charmin eCash app out there. We have no list, no list. Uh, UTXO, the lead maintainer or founder of Nodeless, I guess now he's the lead maintainer, previously founder of Nodeless, uh, recently was in Nashville for the Lightning Summit. By the way, our, our he's panel, in the live chat too. He's in the live chat, and apparently I'm his only friend that's on Signal. Um, the Lightning Summit panels of the speakers that are fine with their conversations being published are being published to the Bitcoin Park podcast feed. If you search Bitcoin Park in your favorite podcast app, you can listen to those lightning summit conversations. Um, I'm basically publishing about two a day. We're a very small organization here. So it's literally me just clicking publish after Tom, our producer does a great job putting them together. So check that out. But uh, UTXO who did visit us in Nashville has now open source node lists. Um, he's also a BTC pay contributor. So he has a lot of experience in that side, but the idea is, uh, with no lists, uh, you can accept Bitcoin without running your own node. It's a trade-off balance in between. Um, 
using BTC Pay Server. Ideally, he wants all users to end up using BTC Pay Server. You can listen to his conversation at the Lightning Summit. We have Lightning Loop v0.26.0 slash beta. Pretty cool new feature. You can make it so when you receive Lightning payments, they automatically get sent on chain via Lightning Loop uh, to a new fresh address if you give them an XPUB. Uh, if you don't know what XPUB is, make sure you ask Peter McCormick. We have Albi extension v3.0.0, <laughs> mnemonic master seed for Bitcoin, Noster, and LN URL auth keys. Um, great to see Albi iterating. I would add that if you are using Noster, check out the NoS 2x uh, extension from Fiat Jeff. It's way, way, way simpler and more, a little bit more straightforward than Albi, a little bit less powerful. You can attach a Lightning wallet to it. Um, Albi's great. I continue to use it all the time. Uh, but no S2X is a good alternative as well, um, particularly if you're managing multiple Noster keys. You have NDK v0.8.0 data vending machine support and NDK React v0.1.1. Um, Pablo's a fucking machine. We talked about this. Uh, last week, um, this idea of, of, of bringing together uh, AI, communicating via Noster and being paid with Bitcoin, incredibly powerful. We have Stemster uh, that allows you to create, connect, and collaborate on, on music using Noster. The Noster ecosystem continues to iterate incredibly fast. It's great to see the viral innovation that is happening in the open source Noster community. Um, I think it's a little bit of an existential threat for something like Noster to have closed source projects uh, dominated market share. So it is incredibly optimistic to see rapid development of truly false uh, projects. Um, that That is how we win. And um, it's, it's really great watching that happen. We have Coracle V0.3.0, faster feeds, better navigation. NIP89 App Store. This was a massive release after uh, a, a a quiet period with no updates to Coracle. Um, definitely check that out. Huge shout out to the contributors there. And then we have Amber V0.0.2, which is a Noster event signer for Android. Right now, when you use one of these mobile apps, you update the app or whatever, you're like constantly putting in a new you're constantly putting in your private key, your Nostra private key. That makes you very vulnerable. It'd be nice to have a app that holds your private key, does not get updated often, uh, you know, reduces your attack surface on someone uh, stealing your private key, and then different apps integrate with that. We see that on web already in Nostra with Albi and NoS 2X and these other extensions. Um, Amber kind of tries to bring that over to Android. There's a bunch of different projects trying to do that, which is really great to see. And with all that said, that is that is uh, the software updates for the week. Thanks, Marty. I think you handled them pretty well. Cheers. Better than that time I tried to do the ad reads the one the one time. Remember in your <laughs> studio apartment, in Brooklyn? Yeah, I was he, like he, he, a quarter of the way through the Unchained ad read, and I just start laughing hysterically, and then Marty read them from that point forward forever. <laughs> Hey, been around the block. Ad reads aren't easy. Speaking of ad reads again, shout out to our sponsors, Unchained and CoinKite. <laughs> Go visit their websites, unchained.com, coinkite.com. Marty, we have, five, tight rip. we have five minutes to our hard stop. Uh, be aware, uh, there will be no soft landing. Uh, the exact no such thing as catastrophic explosion. Everyone, there, there's no such thing. There's no such thing as like a backdoor, uh, preserving pr privacy with an encryption backdoor. Uh, I'm about to win 300,000 sats because the mempool is going to clear before Christmas, and Coinbase is not going to have Lightning enabled yet. What else? Yeah, Kenya listened to the podcast last week. Really cool to see. Um, good week for the brand. The blue checks are complicit. Stay humble, stack sets. Peace and love, freaks. Dickie!